the framers who pushed for the Constitution were fearful that the nation was about to dissolve. They begin with the main procedure, secrecy. We're just going to speak about what we think. The windows will be closed no matter how hot it is this summer, and no one will leave notes outside the convention. Nobody tells what's happening to anybody outside. And they begin shaping something that had never been shaped before in the history of the world. How that could be brought about was something to behold. It was a long, very hot Philadelphia summer. And so you can imagine how tempers ultimately began to flare when they couldn't get anything done. It was a very hard debate. And I think that had the Constitution not come into effect, the unity of the country would shatter. Politics begins in disagreement. Madison says in Federalist 14, remember that we fought together against uh, a common enemy. We fought for the same cause. We share the same language. We were brothers. From 1783 to 1787, things began to unravel. Tariffs between the states, local jealousies, the British still in the forts in the Northwest, the jealousy between the states. And so economically, the country was in a mess, which meant that politically, the country was not in good shape. Even those who would become known as anti-federalists recognized that something needed to be done. Without a governmental structure that can pull us together as a nation, we will fail to become a nation, to stay as a nation. Madison's goal, his life's goal, was to figure out how to make Republican government work so that it could last through the ages. James Madison was everywhere at every time at the Constitutional Convention. He took a seat up front, as everyone knows, in order to hear everyone to take notes, often dramatically putting his pen down when he thought a speech was simply boring. The mind of James Madison was a mind constantly at work on the questions that he thought were most important. He understood that this was a unique moment in history. He once said, we are going to determine whether Republican government can ever be successful. What Madison saw and brought to life in the new constitution was based on his study of the history of political philosophy throughout the ages. He pinpointed the very things that made it impossible for free, small R Republican government to work. And then he was determined to figure out a way to make that work. And here's what Madison said when he thinks he's figured it out. You can feel his excitement leaping off the page when he says, this is the government for which philosophy has been searching and humanity sighing from the most remote ages. This is the government which it is the glory of America to have invented and her happiness to possess. It's Madison who brought the ideas that would become the basis for the Virginia Plan and in many ways the basis for separation of powers and limited government in the form that they ended up in the Constitution. So when the Constitutional Convention adjourns on September 17, 1787, the work really had just begun. Madison insisted that this new Constitution was nothing but a dead letter until life was breathed into it by the American people. In other words, until it was ratified by the people of the several states. The problem was quite a 
good critical mass of people were worried that this Constitution did not include a Bill of Rights. Madison opposed the Bill of Rights. He said, if you set up a series of rights, you are implying that Congress can then legislate on all these other rights. In fact, there could be a danger of a Bill of Rights because it might imply that only those rights listed in the Bill of Rights are rights retained. And so there was a concern of sending that message. And there's a problem. The upstate opposition to the Constitution is enormous. They had lived under a king, King George III, and they were afraid of monarchy coming back, as it were. They wanted to guard against any kind of threat to the liberties of the people. It was not at all clear that they would win ratification. In fact, many people were calling for a second convention. We'll have another convention in which we include a Bill of Rights, they argued. Uh, and then we'll go to ratification. Well, that horrified Madison. You can just feel Madison's frustration. A second convention? The first was hard enough. They made it through the first when all the odds were against them. The Federalists could not say, you know, you're right, we could have done a better job, let's go back to the drawing boards. They had gone through three months of compromises. If they had opened that box again, there wouldn't have been a Constitution. They had to defend it as it was. They had to say, take it or leave it. In convention after convention among the states, the demand was there should be a Bill of Rights. The Constitution almost failed in a number of states because there wasn't a Bill of Rights. But the Anti-Federalists kept beating on this. This was their one almost winning argument. No Bill of Rights, no Bill of Rights. And Madison thought, how can we have a Bill of Rights because they'll lose the Constitution? So Madison and others said, all right, okay, we'll go with a Bill of Rights since it's so much the desire of the people of the United States. So the question is, why did he change his mind? He said, number one, we promised. You know who the people were who were asking for these bills of rights? These people fought alongside of us. They bled and died for the country. They were as much patriotic as we. Why keep them out? Why keep them out? If we pass this bill of rights, it will embrace the whole country into the Constitution. He wanted to heal the country, bring people on board, make the enemies to the Constitution into friends of the Constitution. And lastly, he said, we're the Federalists. We can write the Bill of Rights so it doesn't change the structure of the Constitution. We don't have to touch the Constitution's structure. Just give them the Bill of Rights. And he was right. Is that quite genius? Giving them the Bill of Rights without destroying the structure and the integrity of the Constitution. That's a marvelous attainment. And in fact, when the new government is established, Madison is the de facto leader of the House of Representatives. And one of the first things he does is introduce a series of amendments that would become known as the Bill of Rights. It worked just the way Madison had hoped it would work. And even though he lost on a number of the debates, he lost in the way Madison understood he should lose through compromise, through negotiation, through listening to the other side. And a lesson he learned himself even in the Constitution Convention, that even through his defeats in the Constitution Convention, something came out that was better than he thought he wanted in the beginning. And we had a unified country. We need to find a way, as Madison put it, to share together things that we care about the most. This is the core of self-government. This is the challenge of what it means to be human. And this is what it means to try to live this life in a way that when all is said and done, one can look back and say, it was worth it. And another thing we, we have to understand about Madison and Hamilton to Madison's detriment compared to Hamilton is that Madison could not do rap at all.
Madison was considered father of the Constitution for many years, and now lots of people are saying no, 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 because the Constitution really isn't a reflection of his thought. That's ridiculous. That's I think that's pure trash. <laughs> No, it would have to be one of these intimate theater in the rounds because he'd be such a quiet character, like a Chekhov play. You'd have to lean forward to, to get it. <laughs> Dolly Madison would make a great Broadway show, but James, no. <laughs>